Hey everyone, my name is Brad and I'm going to give a talk today for GoverCon entitled Go is not just on your server, it's in your browser. It's a talk inspired by the journey of creating the Vugu project, which is a Go library intended to compile Go programs to WebAssembly and run them in your browser and to make web UIs. So um, I've been working on this project for I guess it's been over, uh, it's been a bit over a year now, and uh, it's been an interesting experience. I want to talk about it and share how that's gone, and uh, here we go. In this talk, we'll look at the origins of Vugu. We'll talk about what technology is required for Vugu to function correctly, and what is the background to that to put Vugu in context and look at the design decisions involved. We'll also talk about how Vugu works. We'll look at the tool chain of how do we arrive from what you type as a developer to what you end up with running in the browser. We'll also talk about reactive UIs, what that means and how it fits into the architecture. We'll look at Vugu files and we'll type some actual code. We'll do an example and run some things. And then we'll discuss the features of Vugu. What's working now today is actually quite a few different things. And we'll summarize that for you. And then we'll look at the road ahead. We'll talk about what's in store when we look into our crystal ball for the future of the project, what's on the roadmap, that sort of thing. When we look at the origins of Vugu, really what we're talking about here is a discussion of what technology does Vugu use and what's some background to that to put it in context. So if we talk about modern web development, it's no surprise that most of it, and specifically user interfaces here that run in the browser, those are written in JavaScript. However, it's not necessarily because JavaScript is the best solution, it's the solution that's been working. So I would say that JavaScript is chosen by necessity, not necessarily by choice. Now WebAssembly changes the whole game because we can take code written in a number of different programming languages, Go definitely being one of them, and we can compile them to a binary file that runs in your browser. Now, I've written my fair share of code in other languages, C, C++, Java, PHP, for various projects. I've done my time writing code in those languages. And when I moved to writing code in Go, generally, my observation is it's just much more productive. And I would attribute that to the combined effect of all of the smaller individual decisions that went into making Go what it is as a language, what's in the standard library, what's in the runtime, and all of its different features. So the big question here is we already know that Go works well on the server. Can it work well in the browser? I think the answer is definitely yes. But it means rethinking how we're approaching various problems in the user interface. We need to ask for this particular problem that is being solved in JavaScript, what's the Go way of doing it? Take something that's idiomatic in Go and what is the equivalent for a user interface? Now, if we back up just a little bit more and we ask ourselves, why this choice of Go as a language? Well, let's look at our options. If we look at C or C++ and we ask, what are those languages good at? I would say that generally today, a lot of people use C and C++ for specific purposes. If you need to manage memory manually, that's probably a good reason to use it. Or if you have to interact with existing software that already works well in that ecosystem, then that makes sense. Now, as a language, Rust is sort of encroaching on that C and C++ territory. A lot of the things that were being done in C or C++ yesterday, there's more and more developers that are saying, well, I'd rather use Rust for that. And that's fine, it makes sense. However, it's still generally lower level. And to be specific, I say that because Go has things like a garbage collector, Go routines, and an application runtime that handles non-blocking I.O. pretty much transparently. And those are things that work well for building applications. They're good for when you want to get things done and you don't need that lower level control. In essence, Go is for building applications. It's designed for that task. So as Go continues to gain popularity and become used more and more in the application space, I believe more developers are going to ask the question, well, can we use the same language server side and client side? And I think we definitely can. And I hope Vugu gets us closer to that. All right, let's jump in our DeLorean and take a quick trip down memory lane. So today, if you want to look up some information, you probably go ahead and pull out your phone, right? Pretty straightforward. You do a search, your results show up. No surprise there. Everything you need is in your phone, in your pocket, including the connectivity and the computing power, or perhaps in the dash of your car or on the console in your fridge. Our talking fridge is actually a thing. That'd be kind of cool. 
If we go back maybe a decade earlier, you've got a desktop computer that has roughly equivalent computing technology to what your phone does today. So your phone is more just a phone and your desktop computer, it's connected to the internet. You can do your searches and get the information you need, but it's on your desktop instead of in your pocket. Now, if we go back earlier than that to sort of the 90s era, you've got a situation where your workstation is on your desk. It's connected to perhaps a corporate LAN. You know, the computers are in the closet and they're all kind of beige colored because it's the 90s. And your computer's access to the internet is probably via something like dial-up. But the main thing your computer does is connect to that corporate LAN. And perhaps you're running something like uh, Windows for work groups or OS2 or something like that on your desktop. Now, if we go back even earlier, what's on your desktop is really a DOM terminal. It's a not even a workstation. Every single key that you press is sent to a central server, a mainframe over in the computer room, and every character that comes back is sent to your console one at a time. What's sitting in front of you is just a terminal. It's not the main computing power. That's over in the server room. Okay, so what's the pattern here? Yeah, we know everything's getting smaller and faster and cheaper and we've got Moore's Law and all that stuff. Good. That much is clear. However, there's another trend involved here. And this is the idea that as computing power becomes cheaper and more efficient and smaller, it tends to move closer to the user. So in other words, now that we can run more stuff in a smaller space on a phone or closer to us, we do. This gives us this transition from a terminal to a workstation, and even from the desktop computer to the mobile phone. The computing that was on the desktop now can be done on the phone, and so you can put it in your pocket, so we do. And similarly, your phone is no longer just a phone, it doesn't just make calls, it's got a full operating system, all kinds of computing power and memory, a graphics processor, all of that stuff. That's part of that same transition. These things are now in your phone, but they weren't there before. And if you look at it, the browser has sort of made a similar transition. Browsers were originally a document viewer for HTML, in essence. Today, your browser, both the one on your phone and on your desktop, is not just an HTML document viewer. It is a full runtime for web applications. It's hardly a document viewer at all. It's really a computing environment for user interfaces. Which brings us to the next point. WebAssembly is not just about making web applications faster. It's about this whole transition of the browser becoming from whatever it was before to sort of a VM for user interfaces, a whole computing platform. And by the way, WebAssembly will probably see a lot of use on the server side as well. We'll have to see how that plays out. Now with WebAssembly, JavaScript isn't going away anytime soon or if ever, but as support for WebAssembly improves, the ability for user interfaces to be written in other languages will as well. And it means that JavaScript won't be the only option, and I believe it will be unseated as the king of the web UI. Let's talk about how Vugu works and what are the pieces to the puzzle, what goes into a Vugu program. The overall concept here was, can we make something that's like Vue.js in Go? That's where the idea started. There are two main parts of Vugu. The first one is a tool, the command line version is called VuguGen. It's also something you can call from Go code, and it converts .vugu files, which is an HTML-like markup format, into Go source code. And the other part is a library that at runtime converts from a virtual DOM to synchronize with the browser's actual DOM. Vugu files with a .vugu extension contain HTML markup and have additional declarative attributes that add functionality to them. They're only used during code generation. So you run Vugu Gen, it converts your .vugu file to a Go source code file, and the compiler takes it from there. Each Vugu file corresponds directly to a Go struct with a corresponding name. This makes it easy to keep your code organized in a way that you would expect in a Go program. The markup itself gets translated to a build method in the generated file, and it implements an interface that reconstructs the virtual DOM that you typed in. So if you said, this is a div tag, and here's another tag that has this condition on it, that corresponds to what goes into the generated build method. When we need to add functional properties to this markup, we do it with declarative attributes. For example, VGIF is used to add a condition, and VG4 is used to add a loop. These correspond directly to if and for statements 
in the Go language in that build method. And anytime we see an expression in a Vugu file, we can be sure that that is a Go language expression. There's no other template language used. You can also use a special script block to include Go code that gets copied directly to the output file. Or since this is Go, you can just put your Go code in another file in the same package that works just as well. Now the Go source code that gets produced by VuguGen from your Vugu file, normally you don't need to do anything with this. It just gets compiled by the Go compiler and then ends up in the WebAssembly executable. The Vugu library does the heavy lifting of synchronizing the output of your build method with the actual browser DOM. As mentioned before, your components are just structs, they're just Go structs, and otherwise it builds like a regular Go project. Normally, when you're building the UI where you are producing the WebAssembly final output, then you'll set it up so that when you refresh the page, it runs this code generation automatically. If you're making a third-party library for other projects to import, then you probably want to commit that code in with the project, the generated source code. The WebAssembly output is just that. It's a .wasm file that gets loaded into your browser and run by it. There are some caveats. Right now, as it stands, the Go compiler will spit out executables that are somewhere in the a few megabytes range. TinyGo is also an option for that. If you're not aware, TinyGo is an alternate Go compiler based on LLVM, and it's pretty cool, and it produces much smaller output. So that's an option too. There are some trade-offs because TinyGo is not a full feature compiler and support is limited, so you can pick whichever is best for your particular project. And although the tooling is continuing to evolve for Vugu, the core idea is that we want to avoid things that are too magical, the Go compiler is just used as the Go compiler. And usually if you see something that looks like magic, it's really just a thin wrapper around a call out to the Go compiler or Go generate command, something like that. And if you want to customize it, you can. That's a key idea here. And with that, our project runs. This is uh, just a screenshot. We'll get to a live demo in just a moment. But uh, that is a screenshot of a Vugu program, the simple example from the website. And it goes and runs in the browser. And when you click on the word WebAssembly and it pops out this little message or the word Go and it pops out that other message, those are being handled by the WebAssembly executable from your Vugu source code. Let's take a moment and explore this in a little more detail. We'll uh, get out our editor here and let's look at this sample project. Let's make some changes to it and uh, see how this is put together. All right, so for this section, we'll do some coding and we'll take the simple Vugu example that we start with on the website and we'll modify this and make a few changes and just see how that goes. All right, so the first thing here is we're gonna do VG run and we'll do new from example simple this basically just does a git clone pulls this into the current directory simple enough good now if we go over here to our trusty editor we've got a root.vugu which is our main ui file that has the base of the page in it and we've got our dev server.go this is going to be important this is the server that runs this whole thing. It's pretty simple. So the first thing we're going to do here is run this thing using the VG run command. So this is just a little bit of glue here. It's going to uh, just build and run the program, save us a few commands. And we have our program here. Okay, so let's start making some changes. And we're going to change the build system a little bit here. Right now, there is a uh, main WASM. This is the actual main function, the file that has the main function for the program that runs in the browser, as opposed to dev server is just a standalone program. So we're going to change this a little bit. We're going to normally, the best way to do this is to move the actual server into its own pack package. It should be something like CMD server or CMD, whatever the name of your, your program is, you know, slash main.go or something like that. Uh, we're gonna cheat a little bit here and we're just gonna say, um, this is gonna be, we're gonna only build this if we're not the WebAssembly program. And since this is build WASM and this is build not WASM, we sort of have just these two different uh, independent uh, versions of the main package, one for server side, one for client side. And uh, that allows us to make a, drop another file in here and we can use it from both. That's kind of why I'm doing that. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and just run the go generate and go run commands separately. Go generate, 
that will rerun VuguGen. And I'm going to go ahead and do go run dot. Now, of course, uh, this normally would be a, a separate executable you would build with go build and that sort of thing. Go run is just being used to, for expediency here. Good. Now we've got that. We refresh. So we're back where we were. Excellent. Good. So that's done. We're going to go ahead and add. We're going to go ahead and add an endpoint now. So we're going to go down here and what we'll do is we'll add something like uh, entry endpoint. Now we will add this endpoint in the right place here. So this, this mux code is just uh, from the dev util package. It's a simple little muxer that, that is uh, helpful for putting together little test servers and things like that. You don't have to use it, but it works well here. Good. Okay, so now if we go host 8844 API entry. Good, so we have something outputting. Okay, good, simple enough so far. Now, next step is we're gonna go ahead and define a go struct, which is gonna be used for our data. And we're gonna use that same struct for sending information from the server out as JSON and for reading it in the WebAssembly client inside the, the Vugu program. And uh, we can use the same struct on both sides, which is kind of cool. Let's add a file here, types.go, and let's define an entry type. Good, simple enough, right? So an entry is gonna have a name and a description. And what we'll do is we will grab from here, we're gonna grab each of these and just use these as an entry, just for the purposes of our example here. So now we have all of our entries listed out there just statically. Good. Let's go ahead and output them. Let's make sure it worked here. I'll cheat and just put all these on one line. Good, so we go back here and we refresh. There we go, lo and behold, we have all of our data being spit out as JSON. Now let's read it from the Vugu client, the fun part. What we'll do here, I'm gonna move this. This is in a block here. This just gets copied. Any of these script type application X code just get copied to the generated file. I'm gonna go ahead and move the struct definition. I think all we need here is the import statement for, cause that's used above uh, inside the markup. But the struct definition, let's go ahead and move that. And we're gonna put it in a separate file. Now that we have our root struct in a separate file, we're gonna go ahead and add an init method to it. This is one of the lifecycle callbacks. It gets called when the component gets created. And we can use this uh, callback to go ahead and reach out to the server and pull that JSON. Inside the init method here, we can add a call using HTTP.get, which is in WebAssembly, in Go WebAssembly, it's a wrapper around the browser's fetch call. So we can do that just like this. And since it runs asynchronously, we use a Go routine to express that asynchronousness. For our purposes here, a panic will do just fine as the error handling. So far, this is looking pretty normal. This is the same thing we would do in a Go server-side program. Now, in order to make this work, we need to use the fields on the root struct to keep track of the state that this root component shows. So right now we have a local variable entry list and that has the data in it that we want and we need to go ahead and put it on root. And we're gonna use also uh, the event and the event environment to do a lock and an unlock telling it to re-render. I'll show you how that looks. It's pretty simple. And that's it. That should work. Let's try it out. All right. So now if we go back to our main program here and just refresh. Okay, good. Except we totally forgot about making it show on the page. <laughs> How's that going? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and just add here. Let's go ahead and just dump it out for starters. Entry list, go ahead and just blurp it out 
using FMT printf, uh, you know, sprintf or whatever. That's that's what ends up happening here. So let's try that. Let's go ahead and refresh. Okay, it did not work. What happened here? Let's debug it. Ah, okay, look. So from the panic, we can see that, which the panic ended up right here in our console, which is kind of cool. We can see, okay, good. Just like you might expect, I went and forgot to pass a pointer here. Okay, good. Well, that's easy enough to fix. Let's try it again. And look at that. It went ahead and loaded right up. Good. Let's do a little bit of formatting now. Instead of just blorping out the entry list, we're going to make some list items. So let's go and say, and we'll go ahead and use VG4 here to loop over it with a four and a range. Yeah, I had this all figured out beforehand uh, on my Mac and I now have a PC keyboard and that is throwing me off a little bit, but no matter. Note that this has the same syntax. This is exactly what you would see in a go for loop. And we're going to go ahead and just say, we'll make a bold section here and we'll use VG content to go ahead and spit out the name. How about that? Good. That'll get us a name. Now, if we want to do the description, we do something similar. Good. Now we have a name and a description for each one. The name will be in a strong tag. Let's see what it looks like. Excellent. Okay, good. Not exactly world-class styling, but makes the point. In fact, let's just Just because much better. Excellent. So now let's try one other thing here and let's go ahead and make the description be HTML rather than just a text string. So we'll take some component, some, some portion of this and we will throw in a tag or two. Let's see what happens here. So if we go back here and we say, well, we want to go ahead and put an EM tag around this. That's all good and fine. And we go ahead and restart this because that's the server side and refresh. We can see here that it went ahead and spit it out. Okay, well, that's all good and fine, except we don't want that. We want it, we want it to actually uh, embed the HTML in there directly. Okay, so instead of having to handle that in the Vugu file, we're instead gonna change the type of the description field to indicate that it's an HTML field. Any type which has an HTML method that returns a string is implementing the HTML or interface. So if we make a simple type that does that, we can very easily indicate that this is supposed to be treated as raw HTML. So let's do that. That's pretty simple. Now we can change description to type H Go ahead and rebuild. And we can actually see that on the server side, this doesn't really do anything. Obviously it is a different type, but it doesn't have any impact on the server side of the code. But on the client side, it Vugu is calling this HTML method as part of the rendering. And we can see here that we've italicized Go plus WebAssembly. And there you go. That's my demonstration. So it should give you uh, hopefully a better idea of how this thing works and uh, highlight some of those features. All right, let's talk a bit about reactive user interfaces and what that concept means and how it applies to uh, what Vugu is and some design decisions involved. So uh, over the last, I don't know, however many years it's been, as sort of more and more of these frameworks have come out, um, you see this, this idea of, okay, a lot, there's a lot of reactive web frameworks, 
And uh, the meaning of that kind of gets lost in the mix a little bit. Modern web apps can be really complicated uh, when you get into things like shared state management, data binding, and the asynchronous nature of web apps in general. When you're writing a Go server program, usually you can say, good, I want to open this file or connect to this database and pull some information out and return it to the caller. And you can sort of do that synchronously and you let between what the uh, Go library is doing for you, the runtime uh, has some interesting stuff in there for, for making IOB non-blocking and all that stuff. So there's some stuff in there that helps you. And then there's also just the idea that, you know, with multiple requests coming in, each one can happen in parallel and the, the threading and all that stuff sort of makes it so you don't have to worry about is what I'm getting at. Um, however, in a web user interface, because of the latency of what the user interface is doing, it needs to talk to the server and retrieve some data. And there's that, you know, three or 400 milliseconds there where it's, oh, that's, it's if the back ends in PHP, it'll be like that. But in Go, it's the 30 to 40 milliseconds in there to retrieve the information and get it back into uh, the user interface. Well, that, that leaves some time when you need to have a little spinner or you need to respond to that. So the, that's a UI thing. It's, it's uh, you know, I mean, server programs have their own uh, issues, but that's an example of something that's, that's relatively UI specific. But back to the point, reactive means that your view is a function of state. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that you declare some variables, hopefully not global variables, but variables on a struct somewhere, field, struct fields, right? But its point is it's data somewhere in memory and your markup says this thing should show based on this Boolean variable or this thing should be iterated over the number of times of what's in this slice, right? That sort of thing. So, and then the library, Vugu as a library, takes care of performing the synchronization. So you provide the, the, the data and you manipulate the data based on whatever you know the user collects and that toggles this Boolean variable. And then this div is set up to VG if show if that's true. Well, the, the let's say framework, the library, Vugu as a library, will take care of re-rendering when that state changes. It solves, that's the problem that it solves for you. That's the hard part of uh, the heavy lifting that it does. And that's not a Vugo specific thing. That's really uh, when you get down to it, that's what Angular, React, uh, Vue, these other, these other uh, UI frameworks, that is the sort of thing they do. So I just wanted to clearly state that's what this idea of reactive is. And it kind of gets lost when you go, if you go and read the Vue documentation, for example, there's all this different stuff in there. And uh, sometimes the fundamentals the fundamentals get lost. And uh, to make it clear, if we compare what, what was done before, you know, reactive user interfaces were common, we had sort of the, uh, the old jQuery way. You can see down in the, in the bottom left on the slide, it was like user clicks something and then that click handler goes and reaches out and toggles the state on the particular element in question, right? It is that the, uh, we're going out and we're reaching out and telling the UI what to do. Um, whereas in the new way, the UI is bound to this other variable. Now, the thing to understand is that in the simple cases, it's not a big deal. Those are can be effectively the same thing if that's all you have is one Boolean variable. But in a real program, in a, in a real UI with lots of pieces, the relationship between you know, what gets shown and hidden in various cases starts to get really complicated. And as you're writing the code and maintaining it, you have to deal with the the, uh, the cognitive overhead of managing what are all these different, this thing and this list changed over here and this thing hides and shows, this little status bar shows this other way. And so if the variables, the data that drives this whole thing is very clear, it's in a struct, their fields are commented, they have a specific function. And when you need to now say this UI component is now supposed to sync up with that data, that's much easier to think about than to go and find all of the little places where you're showing and hiding things and make sure that you have, you've updated all the things in the different places uh, that can become a real mess. So from where I stand, this idea of reactivity and the view being a function of state is one of the core good ideas that is in a lot of these uh, web user interfaces. 
uh, user interface frameworks and libraries. And we want to repeat that in Vugu. There is other ideas that I think are not as applicable or not as great a design decision. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a moment. Just to recap, so Go is just a library. It's a library like any other. It's not a whole lot of uh, magic involved. We keep that stuff to a minimum. There are a few places where uh, the code generator will try to generate something for you. If it provides initial convenience, that's okay. But we need to also be able to just get in there and make the changes we need to manually as well. That's a big part of the maintainability. So a lot could be said about the different patterns that have emerged when uh, putting together Vugo and trying to build applications in, in this fashion. And uh, though that's not really, it's a little out of scope for this talk, but there's definitely gonna be more information available on that soon. And I hope to do a follow-up video specifically on that. Let's take a few minutes and talk about what Vugo features exist now, what's functional with where the project is at right now. So we have single file components. You can write all your markup in there and say, good, this is my, sidebar or this page or whatever, and that lives in a component file. And I know some of these other uh, UI frameworks have been going back and forth. They see this in view. They kind of go back and forth between, well, wait a minute, should we have our files be uh, markup, right? Should it be primarily a bunch of HTML or should it be primarily code, right? And you know, the React team has JSX where they're like writing JavaScript and sort of embedding HTML right in it, you know, uh, it's a very interesting idea. If you ask me, the bar for creating a new language is quite high. So they made it work with JSX, but it's still kind of funky. And we've got this mix of different things and acquires a preprocessor and all that stuff. So um, anyway, didn't go that route. Also just want to point out that these Vugo files that get converted into Go files are still just their Go files that get, they're in a package like everything else. So you can still put your Go code wherever you want. So anyway, that single file components, those work. We've got DOM events, the sort of, you know, the same ad event listener stuff that you would expect. You can attach those to different DOM elements and uh, process and handle those events. The handler code, as you'd expect, is Go code. There's a little bit of a slight wrapper around these event objects that come in. Some of that was necessary. Uh, to make it work so you can kind of get, you know, prevent default and stuff in your code completion. Um, there might be more stuff that gets added to that, but functionally that that does work. You can do a lot of the, the, the normal stuff. CSS works as you would expect. You can provide inline CSS. You can include CSS from other things. For now, the CSS, the examples that you see with Vugu are using Bootstrap. Uh, it's definitely not tied to Bootstrap or any particular CSS framework. CSS is just CSS. However, uh, I hope to provide some, some other good examples that show all this stuff working together because obviously a big part of this is making web applications that look nice, that are presentable, that are usable from a user interface perspective. So, but in essence, CSS is just CSS. The things you need for integrating in uh, conditions, VGIF, VG4 for loops, VG content for providing HTML or text inside of uh, different elements. Those things all work more or less as you would expect. Another design decision is on the VG content property. So right now you go VG content equals a variable. And uh, earlier in the beginning of the project, it would always expect that it was HTML. And if you wanted to escape it, right, if you needed to to provide a, you know, a, a less than symbol and you needed to, to have that be HTML, you'd have to run it through the HTML escape function in Go. But then if you look at what other frameworks ran into, or specifically Vue, they go, well, we were concerned about people having escaping problems and accidentally spitting out content that has a markup in it that you know could have a script tag in there and do JavaScript things and stuff that was unintended. So they said, well, we're gonna escape everything by default and then provide this other mechanism over here for raw HTML and then provide a bunch of warnings that tell you not to use it. Um, so I look at this, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What's happening here for Go, we probably can just use the type system. Even if you just look at like, what does the funt package do? You know, you provide percent this and it goes and it uses reflection to look at the, look at that particular type and do something that's sensible for it. So in our case, we can say, well, if you pass a string and you say VG content equals this thing and it's a string, it will escape it. 
because it wants to make sure that by default you do escape these things. Well, we can also provide a type that implements an interface that returns the raw HTML. So that makes it very easy to attach a customized behavior and it is in the type, just like you would expect in a Go program when you have a variable and it is of type string, well that defaults to just text that gets escaped. If it's of type HTML or anything that implements the HTML or interface, then it emits raw HTML and then you can kind of customize that. But um, that's an example of using the Go type system for what it's good for, and it's something that is not feasible to do in JavaScript, but it works really well in Go. There's some dynamic attribute support, which actually was a great contribution. It's, you can see that in the, the change log. There's been some actually really good contributions from other people. Very, very appreciated, very cool. And uh, But dynamic attributes means that on an HTML element, you can say, good, I want to provide some custom code that'll control uh, what additional attributes we do here. Um, so anyway, that's that's been kind of smoothed out and we have some pretty good control over the the, uh, the how we can specify a bunch of the, the different cases for what the attributes in an, uh, in an HTML element are. You can do static components where you just say, good, this section of the page needs to have this component in it and you can just simply reference it. By the way, such references, if you have page A and it is going to put in this uh, content box, and this is your component called content box. And so here you say content box. That actually translates directly to a variable declaration and then creating a new instance of the content box struct. In a lot of these other frameworks, that sort of relationship of one component to the next is highly dynamicized. Each component has some sort of registration process and there's a list of all the components and then kind of magically talk to each other through maps and all this stuff. And as it turns out, we can again use the Go language for what it's good for. And when we have a reference to a component, it is just instantiating that struct. In addition to static components, there's dynamic components. You can say this section of a page or of some other component is actually a variable or a field on a struct rather. And you can then have custom code that then goes assigns it and says just pops this struct instance in there, and then that then becomes that section of the page. So you, you can either statically control it or dynamically control it. Both of those work really, really well. Components have lifecycle callbacks that was added recently, uh, a call to say, good, this is what you need to do to initialize this component. There's a function that gets called that you can use to handle the pre-computation before rendering occurs. There's a callback after the thing gets rendered. And then there's a call to say, do any cleanup, a kind of a destructor sort of thing. As I mentioned before, there's some TinyGo support. TinyGo as a compiler has a slightly different objective than the Go project overall. Uh, they're not trying to support every single Go program and get 100% functionality. Instead, it's more like, well, what's the 95% functionality that we can use to then get, still be usable as a Go programming language, but get us a significantly smaller uh, file size. And so because of that, there are some challenges, but it's gonna keep getting better. And I hope that very soon we'll be able to use TinyGo as a compiler to compile, compile full featured uh, web applications. Vugu will also do server-side rendering. You can go, since we already have functions that are spitting out all this virtual DOM and synchronizing with the browser, well, you know, design-wise, those are actually split up into different steps. So it's very easy to take that same virtual DOM and spit that out server-side and use it to render pages. You can also do a sort of a combo thing where you spit out a static page, also, you know, from a Go web server, and then you dynamically in WebAssembly augment it and, you know, sort of have that that semi, that that server, they call it server-side rendering in, uh, I think that's the, the React or Vue term. But you can do that sort of stuff in Vugu, all that sort of stuff is supported and, and possible um, if you need it. It does have a functional URL router, so you can go and wire up your different pages and, and routes, it supports, the, you know, you can do the hash, ha, hashtag version of it and it'll do, you know, push state and all that stuff where you can do it uh, the other way, either way, uh, you can get single page application support. Needs more testing and uh, and to be fleshed out a bit more, but it does work. It's also got some interesting variable binding stuff in there. So you can say, good, this URL parameter corresponds to this field on the struct. It'll actually do a uh, two-way, kind of semi-automatic variable binding there. 
again, needs a little more work to be to be tuned in, but I'm really excited about the ease of use that that can that that can provide. There is uh, modification tracking for you know faster renders. Essentially, it will check and see does this thing need to be rendered again. Won't go to it in too much detail, but you have some pretty detailed. Uh, control over that. There's some default behavior where it'll kind of scan things and check. You can also override that by implementing an interface and provide an exact uh, means to say, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't need to be re-rendered. But the default behavior is there as well to make it simple. It also has slots, which if you're not familiar, is a way of just saying I've defined a component, but when it gets used over here, the caller can also insert in this portion what they want. So you have a data table and you can say, well, I want to stick in this other sub component here as the row or as an individual field, that sort of thing. So it has a mechanism for those slots as well. There is form support, so work in progress, but you can do things like, you know, text boxes and text fields. Uh, I think there's a list box component. So more work to be done on that. I have a feeling that forms, what I have it right now as forms, will really evolve into uh, a, a material, you know, UI component set. And uh, so probably forms is not quite the right abstraction and probably want more, a little bit higher level elements like a text input that includes the label that kind of like goes, you know, floats up and down or whatever, and the error message below it and that sort of thing. That's uh, one of the challenges in the design of this stuff is figuring out what is the right abstraction for all this. So we'll see. I've been trying a few things out, talk to some people about ideas on that, and uh, hopefully more on that very soon. It does support hot reloading. I did that just to kind of woo some of the JavaScript developers. You know, I don't care about that stuff too much, but some people like that. You know, you, you save the file and you see the browser automatically refresh over here. So it'll do that if you want it. And uh, there's some decent documentation, some, some examples. Uh, it really needs more love as these patterns get sorted out. I, I really hope to be able to do more detailed, in-depth documentation and while well, keeping it concise, of course, uh, in, in true Go style. So there, there's more to go, but yeah, there's quite a bit of existing functionality and uh, I've been hacking away on this. Other people have been hacking away on this for uh, over a year now and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And to close out, let's take a look at the road ahead. What is the roadmap for Vugu? What are the key challenges that we're up against? So one of the main things that Vugu needs is a decent component library. I've actually been doing uh, more research on this lately and kind of looking into what are some of the different ways that this could be approached for Vugu. And uh, it's interesting. If you look at, for example, Bootstrap, what they have is it's essentially just a bunch of classes and it's primarily CSS. There are a few places where they said, well, this would be really nice to have. So, but it requires JavaScript. So the tool tip, you know, to make this really work, we've got to hook in some JavaScript there. But for the most part, it, a button is a class, BTN, and you attach that and there's like a large and a small and whatever, the different, the different things. It's essentially just a CSS framework. Now that's really cool. And there's a lot of potential for that with Vugu because of the simplicity. Uh, I tend to be a, not a big fan of adding abstractions where they're not needed. Right. If we're going to go and say that this is an HTML element and is a button or an a tag, a link, right, and it should look like this style, then if it's just a style, then why don't you just use style CSS and just attach a class to it? We don't need to wrap that with a button component if the button component doesn't provide any functionality. So that much I really like about what Bootstrap has. So now if we take another UI component library like Viewtify for Vue, and they've taken a different approach and it's really simple to use because they've just got tags for everything, right? They've wrapped everything. They've kind of taken the opposite approach. And if you want to uh, have a, a form with different uh, elements and different things, you sort of just copy and paste their thing in there and each tag is a component. So you're not writing an input field um, or even really like a, a form tag or any of this stuff. You've got a V text field and a V form and a V this and a V that and a V button and all these things. And uh, you don't attach any styles to it. It has styles kind of baked in. Now you can sort of override them, but you see what's happening here. They've kind of said, well, for convenience, we're going to provide our own separate language here. 
Um, in my opinion, this is not a good design decision. I realize it can be convenient, but it's an abstraction and I question whether or not that much abstraction is necessary. And then another approach, if you look at the Tailwind project, they've gone and said, well, you see, <clears throat> we're tired of websites looking all like one another. And, and it's true. Uh, if you, you can spot a bootstrap site from a mile away. I completely acknowledge that. But um, they've gone and said, well, we should just provide a bunch of utility classes, right? Like, why, why do we need to, uh, you know, have these? You, you can always make your own app bar or whatever. But really what you want to say is here's a div and this is the color and this is that and whatever. And they provide this sort of shorthand little uh, BG color blue, B BG... BG600 blue or whatever it is. And that's kind of like the same as background color, uh, whatever, right? It's a sort of shorthand utility class concept. Now uh, that's interesting and I can see why they, they chose that approach. However, um, they really just, in my mind, and like that looks like just a shorthand for a CSS. You know, that's really what seems to have happened there. You still, if you want to get something done, you still have to make your own button. You still have to make your own card. You still have to make your own menu. Um, and that becomes cumbersome, right? So I think Tailwind is going to be really good at things like landing pages, where there's not a huge amount of functionality, but you really want to customize the look. That case, okay, I get it. I understand. You want to quickly go through and bump these things around uh, and say, good, yeah, this should be double the margin. So you use the M-2 or whatever, and it just kind of doubles the margin. Good. I understand. But uh, if we're building applications, we don't. We, we want to be able to customize the style, but we need defaults. We want to also be able to say, just make me an input box. Yeah, the normal one like we always do. And then you can style over it. That's really what we're trying to achieve. So there's still a few different things being looked at, but what I think it's going to boil down to is this concept of separating out a good default set of base styles similar to what Bootstrap does. There's a style that makes a button and it's the BTN class or whatever, and you can just put it on a tag or a div tag or whatever, and it gives it the button look. And uh, there can be, you know, this usually these CSS frameworks also have a set of base variables so you can kind of set the the uh, primary color and the secondary color and uh, set your warning color to be more of an orange color than than red or or, or whatever you're doing right so uh, you can you can customize those things but the point is we want a set of base styles that give us a rich library of things that look a certain way and we've got them as CSS classes because it is the style. Then on the other side of it, we have the functionality, right? There's all the little things that you can't get just from CSS. You can do a lot with CSS. You can even do these little animations. You can do all kinds of stuff. But, you know, if you're writing a data table and you need to click the column header and change the sequence on something, that is not going to come from CSS. It's not a style problem. That is a functionality program problem. That needs to be inside the Go code in our case. And uh, we need to be using Go interfaces and uh, types and that sort of thing to implement that functionality. So I think the answer lies in having a good set of base styles and a set of components that each time we need that additional functionality, we implement that as a Go component. And all it does is it does the functional part. And when it needs to say, good, this thing changes this visual behavior, it just adds a class or removes a class or whatever, right? Changes the structure, adds the column in the data table, or sorry, the row in the data table, and it attaches the default class names and the style sheet matches up to it. And if you had it like this, then you could all of a sudden very quickly go through and assemble the pieces to the puzzle. You can style over it to your heart's content, but the simple things can stay simple, but you also can get complex things like uh, data tables, like charts, that sort of thing. You notice Bootstrap's functionality is kind of limited because they kind of said, well, at a certain point, we need all this JavaScript and it gets really complicated and it's not a style problem, so forget about it. They just kind of cheated on tooltips and a, a few other things, right? Because they're like, well, it's so, so cool, it's so useful. So, but in this case, we don't have to stop. If we understand the difference between what is a style problem and what is a functionality problem, 
we can take each one as far as it needs to go and we can build a really rich component library. That's what I hope uh, can be accomplished for Vugu. It's gonna take some work, but uh, that's coming. Uh, on the next thing on performance, we do need to see what's gonna happen when we have a very large project. Um, right now, the projects that have been built with Vugu are you know, somewhat small, they're kind of, kind of trivial. So we need to see when we start building larger, big enterprise sort of applications, what's gonna come up. But I, I'm pretty sure that between uh, Go as a language and what WebAssembly is doing, that whatever performance problems we run into will be solvable. You know, now some of them might not be the easiest solve, but we really should be able to achieve uh, really fast performance with this setup. And we'll just have to see what it takes to get there. So that's coming to file size. Similarly, you know, TinyGo is an option. We wanna make that work well. I'm pretty sure the file size will improve with the Go compiler itself. It's just gonna take a little bit to get there. And then uh, a more, you know, abstract higher level thing is just finding and documenting what are the different patterns that, uh, that, that come up? You know, there's so many little things that are, you know, this is how it's done in JavaScript. And you kind of think about the problem, you try things out and you kind of go, oh, wait a minute, Go already has something for this. Why don't we just use that? But it takes a little bit of, of thinking about how, how, does this, how does this problem map over the, the example of VG content and using uh, types and interfaces to make the decision about is this HTML or is it text? That's a very good example. There's some other ones too. So each time we find one of these patterns, we want to make sure that we have enough documentation so that that can be easily uh, conveyed. I mean, a, a huge percentage of the uh, the challenge involved in a project like this is finding good ideas and then telling other people about them in a way that is not overly long and, and complicated. So um, like this talk. <laughs> One of the places this is going to be particularly applicable is state management. That is probably one of the most complicated aspects of the entire, uh, you know, the, the problem of, of building these web user interfaces is managing these large, complex object graphs of all the state information that goes into an application. And... Um, which, you know, when you have one component that needs to talk to, well, you don't want the component to talk to another component directly, but they use the same data, right? That sort of thing is, uh, can get quite complicated in application. But again, it's another one of these things where we can use the language to help us. Um, if you take a look at data binding, for example, in Vue, um, if, if you're not familiar with it, essentially you have like a, a function that then references it, it, it says, good, I'll go grab this other, uh, let's say it's an array of something and it uses the array and it loops over and it produces like a new version of the array, which is the formatted version that you want to show in the UI, right? So because you've referenced that earlier array, this function will get called again when the thing changes, right? And so they've attached this event listener and done this and kind of hooked this whole thing up. And there's quite a bit of complication. And of course, edge cases, sometimes this doesn't work, right? Um, but this whole thing gets quite complicated. And in Go, if you kind of take a step back and look at it, you're like, well, wait a minute. Why is there such a confusion about whether or not this piece of information is the same as this other piece of information? In JavaScript, um, I think you would discover if you go around and ask uh, developers, uh, JavaScript developers, if you have an array, sorry, an object here, and then you pass it, you know, to a function to this other code over here, is it the same object or a different one? Now, an experienced JavaScript developer will, will know that it's passed by reference, but uh, maybe someone with less experience, it, it wouldn't know that because it's not emphasized in the language. The language doesn't make it clear. In Go, when you learn about the types, when you see a pointer, you know what a pointer is. That's, that's what it does. So if we want two pieces of information to represent the same thing and stay in sync with each other, we just need them to point at the same thing. And so that's just another example of where let's let the design decisions from the language uh, influence how we organize and solve this particular problem. So anyway, it's uh, all that said, state management is a complex topic, but I hope it can be made simpler. And I hope also there can be more examples of you know good ideas and how this can be managed well. So that's coming as well.
For the moment, Vugu is just a, a, a volunteer project. I, I do it nights and weekends. Other people contribute in various ways. But I hope that it can become more of an officially sponsored thing so that it can sort of get the love that it needs and all these things that uh, I've been talking about can, can get done. So they're, right now they're happening. They're happening a little, little slower than I would have hoped, but uh, they are happening and it, the pace is picking up and I'm really excited about the future for it too. And I also really want to say thanks to everyone who's watching this, to anyone who's, who's contributed or used the project. Um, all these things are great and uh, it's got me really excited. If you are working on a, a, a Vugu project or you know you want to get in touch with me or ask me questions, I have no problem with that. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to answer you in a, in a timely manner. I'm all over those uh, GitHub issues and so forth. But um, yeah, I'm pumped about it and I hope you are too. Thanks very much for taking the time to watch this. Catch you later.